I just want to confirm we have our quorum, so I'll do a roll call. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, before I start that, I just want to uh, make sure that everyone understands that we do record our meetings and then they'll be available for our archives. <clears throat> Commissioner Cameron, good morning. Uh, here, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, Commissioner O'Brien, good morning. Good morning. And Commissioner Zinnica. Here, good morning, everybody. Good morning. And Commissioner Stevens. Here, good morning, everyone. We have our, our forum. And just as a reminder, um, associated with the outbreak of the pandemic, Governor Baker did provide some relief in the open meeting law, allowing us to run our public meetings through this vir virtual mechanism. So today we will be meeting remotely using collaborative remote technology should anything disrupt this please visit our website at masking.com and uh, we'll have further introductions there we'll call we'll call to order meeting public meeting of the massachusetts gaming commission number 306 today is thursday june 16th 2020 it is 10 Three. Before we get started, I just want to say that we are really pleased today to have the opportunity to discuss horse racing. We've invited representatives from Plain Ridge Park Casino, Penn National, and Harness, the Harness Horsemen's Association of New England to participate in a roundtable discussion on next steps to reopening the racetrack at PPC. The Commission uh, always prioritizes the safety of the horses and the riders. This year, however, we must make paramount the health and well-being of every individual involved in horse racing in light of the continued public health risks associated with the coronavirus pandemic. Today, we will discuss protocols for conducting safe and sustainable racing as the Commonwealth's economy begins to reopen in phases determined by Governor Baker so administration based on public health metrics that are associated with COVID-19. Any guideline discussed or established today is of course subject to the governor's industry specific guidance that his administration may issue as well as any additional federal, state, and local standards, rules, and regulations. We'll also have the opportunity to discuss, to discuss at least preliminarily, I think, additional next steps for opening up the track and the commencement of racing. Under Governor Baker's initial reopening guidance, the racetrack had been slated for opening in phase four. Recently, that designation shifted and the reopening of the racetrack is now set for phase three, aligned with the timeline established for the casinos. Today's discussion is intended to be as controversial as this virtual format permits. I'll do my best to ensure that everyone is heard. Please feel free to lean in or raise your hand. And I ask my fellow commissioners to help me in that effort to make sure that I don't miss anyone. So thank you. At this point in time, I'm going to turn it over to our interim executive director, Karen Wells, and our director of racing, Dr. Alex Lightbound. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. Uh, I'm happy to report things are looking very positive for a reopening right at the beginning of phase three, consistent with the governor's uh, guidelines. And we do understand the importance of the industry to those whose livelihoods depend on racing. Uh, so this is a bit different from the process the MGC had for reopenings of the casinos because we only have one licensee engaged in live racing. Therefore, instead of the MGC putting out proactive guidelines for racing, uh, the proposed plan, uh, we are reviewing the proposed plan submitted by Park Casino and our director of racing and the Harness Horsemen's Association can provide the commission with feedback in this uh, round table format. My understanding is that we're in a very good position regarding the plan and opening as soon as possible. So I'll just turn it over to Alex, you know, for her comments and then uh, PPC can give you the highlights from the plan and then we can engage in the discussion after that, if that makes sense to all the commissioners. I think that makes sense. Does that sound good, fellow commissioners? Excellent. Okay. okay. Alex, good morning. 
Good morning. Good morning, commissioners. Um, and um, today we have uh, Chris Mackerline with uh, Penn National Gaming with us uh, to talk about the Penn plan for opening Plain Ridge. Also, uh, Bob McHugh, the president of the Harness Horsemen's Association, Frank Antonacci, a director with the group, and Marty Corey. Um, and they'll all be uh, participating in the roundtable discussion. Um, we've had uh, numerous talks over the last couple of months about um, how to reopen and um, I feel like we have a good plan in place right now. And um, I'm happy that we're reaching this stage where it looks like um, opening is on the horizon. Um, I think everybody is very excited about that. And um, with that mentioned, I'll uh, turn it over to Chris. Thank you, uh, Alex, uh, and uh, members of the commission. Uh, Chris Mackerlane from Penn National Gaming representing uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino. Um, I thought I would uh, start out because I, I know that a, a major concern through this whole process has been uh, some certainty on, on dates. And I know early in the process, there was a date put out there, which um, again, because of the, uh, the various phases could, could not be met. Um, and uh, now that as we approach phase three, as, as uh, the chair had indicated, um, does allow the uh, resumption uh, of uh, casino and horse racing activities. Um, I would like to, you know, put, put out there right now that uh, barring any changes in any of the language or, um, uh, I guess, guidelines put out by the, the governor's office, uh, we are uh, making preparations to conduct qualifying races on June 29 and July 2nd with the intention to have our first live uh, paramutual race on Monday, July 6th. So we are targeting those, uh, those dates uh, and those activities. Uh, we're putting all our plans in motion to hit those targets. Again, assuming no changes in, in any of the uh, requirements um, under the governor's guidelines. And uh, again, I think um, that will give everybody, um, the horsemen, the track, the commission uh, targets to, uh, to hit uh, and to be prepared for. Uh, the qualifying races will give us a, an opportunity to run through the uh, initial protocols that we have in place to make sure that uh, A, uh, they're achievable, and uh, if we need to make any adjustments. Uh, so they're a good dry run for those uh, protocols. And um, also, obviously, we'll give an opportunity for those horses to have a uh, racing or charted line, as they call it, um, uh, for, um, for their performance and, and for, their, um, um, for their activity. Uh, we also think that that's a, a good sign for the betting public to have a recent uh, past performance line for the uh, horses so they have more confidence in betting on the condition uh, of the horses that it will be racing. And uh, we think that that is uh, following uh, similar protocols that are in place at other locations with having qualifying races before the start of live racing. So we're, uh, we're happy to put that information out. Uh, hopefully that. Uh, clears up or, or gives uh, some uh, clarity as to what the plans are uh, for racing uh, to resume at Plain Ridge Park. It's obviously been a long time coming, uh, but we think that uh, we now have a target to shoot for. Everyone does now, and uh, we're going to move uh, towards um, hitting those targets uh, for the resumption of live racing. Before we go on to the protocols, perhaps we should just address the the dates. I think I did hear you say, Chris, that they were subject to the governor's, um, you know, any shifting in the starting, the anticipated start date for the phase three. Is it fair to presume that the, um, that if the phase three were to commence in mid-July, the spacing or the expectation for the the uh, the start dates would remain the same. In other words, if it were July 13th was the beginning of phase three, would the 
they begin the qualifying race on that same day if it's at the goal, the same, the same case. And then two days later, or a few days later, have the next qualifying race. Uh, in terms of, I, I just I want understand. to make sure that the expectation would be if they phase three can't begin on July on June 29th, you would the qualifying races be able to start at the, in the same cadence that you've described this morning, just on the later date, if the governor were to say phase three starts later? If if the phase three uh, had the uh, limitation that racing could not take place at, at that at that time, then yes, we we would follow that that guidance, and you know we we can shift those dates if, if necessary. Our our hope is that that obviously the uh, uh, the governor uh, will not have any changes uh, to the to the protocols or to the um, allowing of, of live racing but um yes but just to be sure. clear it would only, I, only be I, the change would be driven by public health metrics uh, that's what i'm saying should there be any change in in the start date of, because i believe Correct. there hasn't there hasn't really been a firm date given to the beginning of of um of phase three we have surmised so that was my only question was in other words your intent is to, to regardless of the actual designated opening day of phase three to begin the qualifying races right at the same time. Is that fair? That would be correct. Great. And Mr. Antonucci, are you good with that? Yeah. So first of all, Frank Antonucci, uh, representative for the, for the horsemen and women. Uh, good morning. So thank everybody on the commission for allowing us a seat at this table and, and letting our voice be heard. Um, it's and it and I and I must say that the the horsemen and women have been uh, greatly harmed, like many of us in in this pandemic. Uh, but the uncertainty and the anxiety that came along with all of that, uh, along with all the financial distress uh, and emotional distress they've, they've had, uh, has really exacerbated the the issue. And and I think from what I just heard from Mr. McElwain and, and Penn. Um, this is going to go a long way with with our community in alleviating uh, some of the unneeded stresses in their lives to understand what they can be shooting for, uh, with the understanding as 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 the chair has pointed out that it's all based on uh, the date being released by the governor's administration. Uh, but I think to understand that there's a commitment now. Uh, uh, and hopefully the support of the commission to get us up and racing as soon as possible. Um, people feel a heck of a lot better about things. So we, su we fully support that plan uh, that Penn has, has laid out and we discussed the protocols with, with all of you today to get you all comfortable successfully to commence racing at the earliest point possible. Great. Commissioner Cameron and other commissioners, would you like to chime in at this point before we go into the protocols? I, just the plan is is solid. I, I agree with that. I've had a chance to discuss it with uh, Dr. Lightbaum um, and also some of the safety issues around uh, qualifying. Um, I don't know if Dr. Lightbaum wanted to take this opportunity to add to um, to to the importance of that. I think we can discuss the qualifying races a little bit later as we go through the plan. Um, but the, the good news, it sounds like everybody understands that, that there would be qualifying races at the beginning um, before the paramutual starts up. So I think that you're absolutely right. There are um, issues around that. So um, <clears throat> other uh, comments, commissioners, on just sort of the, the idea of the start? Yeah, the, the, for me, um, um, I, I think it's it's it's, uh, it's understood that um, the the activities start when whenever it's uh, it's safe and directed by the governor, and it starts with the qualifying races. Uh, that that's great to know. I had a question about those qualifying races and, and compared to prior years, which I know had been um, one of the um, we we had received some correspondence to that effect. So if we're going to 
talk about that later. I'll hold my question for them. I think that's right. I think we'll get right into the protocols, the guidelines first, in, in accordance with our, our agenda, because the qualifying races comes up a little bit later. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Um, Chris, do you want to go through the begin, uh, discussing the protocol, or did you have other comments you wanted to address? Uh, no, I, I'm not sure if Dr. Lightbaum wanted to uh, do the protocol um, or. Well, how would you like to proceed uh, in terms of just maybe hi the highlights, Alex? Um, as we walk through, there's submission from both. Um, uh, Plain Ridge Cas uh, Park Casino, Penn National, as well as from uh, the Har Harness Horsemen's Association. I believe that you have collaborated on these. Alex, is it fair to say that there's that there's general agreement with the proposal presented by PPC? Yes, uh, as you uh, are aware, the Harness Horsemen um, submitted a plan early on, and um, a lot of those um, guidelines that were in that plan are incorporated in the Penn plan um, for Plain Ridge Park. And um, on our meeting last Friday, uh, the horsemen said they agreed with the protocols that um, Penn has uh, put out there in their plan. So I think everybody's on board right now with that plan. Can um, you walk us through the highlights, if that makes yeah. sense? Uh, so the main thing is, is um, the uh, key issues are the social distancing, um, the disinfecting and how that goes into um, a business like the racing business. Um, the, we, the general thing is everybody wears a mask at all times, um, doing the social distancing, um, restrictions on the people that can come onto the grounds. Um, for now, we won't have owners on the grounds. It'll just be the people that are directly involved in um, the racing, such as trainers, drivers, grooms, um, the official staff, um, the maintenance staff, um, and that type of people. Uh, we're going to restrict access to um, the uh, racing office, the white building, so-called. Um, so anything that um, takes place in there, such as Horses being entered or um, talking to the judges and um, licensing um, will be done electronically to the best of abilities. Um, we're still working on the guidelines for the licensing because our system just doesn't um, allow for um, online licensing. And uh, we've, we've discussed various um, ways of doing it, um, including uh, postponing um, payment of licenses or um, letting licenses be uh, granted through the end of the year if they already had been licensed last year, different things like that. And going back to that, I think probably the easiest thing for us in all of these different areas is to keep things as much um, like we have done things in the past as we can, but still bring these COVID plans into place. So we'll probably end up just um, putting, having a lock box outside of our office that people can deposit their um, applications into along with their payment. Um, and all, obviously um, we'd strongly recommend people mailing them in. Um, they can fax um, their applications in as well. Um, they'd still have to um, turn in the money. Um, Things can I, like um, can I just break there, Commissioner Cameron and um, and others, in terms of the piece on licensing, because that is out uh, for Dr. Lightbound, that is strictly um, uh, measures that we would impose. Correct. We want to work with the others, but should we should we mark this up for another date? Because we do need to give firm guidance on that, don't you? Do you agree? I agree. In fact, I was just going to ask the question uh, to Dr. Lightbaum. If in fact, if we make some kind of an amendment, does that require a regulation change um, that we could do by emergency basis? If that's the case, uh, Dr. Lightbaum, do you? Um, or, or Mr. Grossman. Yeah. Or Mr. Grossman to help out with that. You're right. Yeah, it would require a um, regulation change. So I do think once there's a firm decision here, um, 
we can have, you know, as, as the chair mentioned, um, put it on the agenda quickly for an emergency uh, reg change. Yep. And, um, you know, just as an aside, I have had um, talks with our legal department on some of our other protocols, and um, we may end up um, having to bring those um, to the commission um, for uh, some leniency or switching on those items. Um, so just getting back to the plan. Well, I, I was, I'm sorry, uh, Director Lightbound. I was just going to add, just to uh, refine the point a little bit, I think we could actually just engage in a waiver variance process. We don't necessarily need to change the regulations. Mm -hmm. So the commission will likely have the ability to be a little bit more nimble when it comes to like the licensing process uh, potentially. And as uh, Director Lightbound mentioned, there's a few other things that may come up procedurally that may require the commission's attention as well um, that we are looking at and she'll get into maybe some of those as we move forward. But um, we think it's, it's entirely possible for the commission to be able to address all these fairly quickly. And via a waiver as opposed to a reg change. That's um, absolutely okay. A variance, yeah. Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so, so as you note those those matters, Alex, to the extent that we need to just make sure that we are aware of our work, they will focus on the protocols for. Penn National and PPC and the um, Horsemen's Association. So this, uh, that's excellent. Chris, would you? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I, I can go through a, a um, kind of a, a, a quick overview of, of uh, the items that, as Alex uh, had indicated, I mean, the, uh, the keys that, that we're looking at, and, and again, we, we have several racetracks that are, that are now racing uh, under some similar protocols. We just opened our uh, harness track in Western Pennsylvania, uh, the Meadows this past week, um, which has harness racing. Uh, and, um, you know, some of these protocols are, are similar. I think one unique thing with Plain Ridge, um, we, we have a, a barn area there, which we're normally, uh, the way the race, uh, races flow, we have, um, seven races at one time in our, our paddock. Uh, obviously for social distancing and, and uh, other concerns, we're not gonna have that many races at one time in the paddock, probably uh, three at four at the most, so they'll be spaced out. So we'll have to utilize more of the barn area, um, which will arrange stalls uh, according to how many horses a trainer has. Uh, as Alex mentioned, we will, um, uh, try to limit as much as possible the uh, individuals who are allowed in the uh, backstretch area to only essential personnel. And in terms of the number of horsemen uh, and grooms with each horse, uh, limiting that uh, based on the number of horses they have entered. Um, everyone coming through will come through a centralized area, uh, will be temperature checked. Uh, face masks, as Alex mentioned, will be required of all individuals while they're uh, in um, in the backstretch area. Um, social distancing as much as we can uh, possibly do. Um, we will uh, close our lounge area for the drivers to eliminate congregation uh, areas. Uh, we're encouraging, obviously, people to um, weather permitting be out be outside as as much as possible. Um, we're asking uh, our side and the horseman side, obviously taking responsibility for their respective workers uh, in making sure they're well versed on um, uh, COVID issues and um, you know sanitizing and and having the proper materials. Um, we will be supplying sanitizing agents and things like that in a lot of the common areas. Um, and um, again, the, the, the main basics really come down to the social distancing, face masks, uh, temperature checks, uh, and limiting the number of individuals uh, in, their, in the respective areas. We're gonna learn some things hopefully when we get to the qualifiers and we, we know logistically or we have a, um, a theory as to you know, how things should flow. Uh, I'm sure once we get into practice, there'll be some alterations. As I mentioned, uh, our track that just opened in Pittsburgh, 
Uh, we had a plan uh, for the paddock, and after uh, one day of racing, we've gone back and reformulated that based on the experiences that we had. So it's it's a uh, it's a fluid document, but uh, we think in terms of a game plan, uh, again, these are very similar items that are being done at other other racetracks uh, around the country, um, and we think that uh, you know they're achievable. They will um, serve the purpose of, of what's uh, necessary for uh, proper health of the uh, individuals that are competing uh, in the races, and uh, you know will allow us to. Um, you know, conduct live racing in a, in a safe and sustainable manner. Should we pause just now for questions at this juncture and then move on? Um, Commissioner Zunigai, do you have questions? Yeah, I, um, I, I have a question. Um, uh, is there any indication, uh, Chris or Alex or, or anybody that, um, um, that the, the horses themselves can be either uh, carriers or a source of communication of the virus where all of these some of these measures need to extend to them or are we only talking about we're mostly talking about uh, humans uh, human distancing yeah there's no um, indication that it's um, transmitted by horses um, and um, we have um, biosecurity measures in place for the horses that we've been doing um, for years as far as things like disinfecting the tie chains between um, races, um, washing, you know, and disinfecting water buckets and that type of thing that um, both um, MGC and um, PPC have been doing. Um, so um, that kind of, uh, those kind of methods are already familiar to us. So it makes adding the, um, these type of protocols onto the uh, human population a little bit easier for us since we've already done it on the horse side. Other questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, yes, okay. Commissioner O'Brien first. Come on. Thank you. Um, I had two, one, one specific to this, one is a more general question. Um, I would be interested if, if whatever the timeline is in terms of the first qualifying race day, um, I would really love for the commissioners, be it uh, maybe, you know, two by twos and a one-on-one -on -one with Alex um, to get an update on how it went. So to the extent that I know you've done it before, you probably don't anticipate drastic changes after doing the qualifying races but i would be interested to get an update on how that first day goes so that if there's some reason we need to readjust what we're talking about today um, we'd have the most lead time to do it yes and that's an advantage of um, having the qualifiers uh, about a week before the opening day is that we'll be able to use them as a dry run and and um, see if anything needs to be adjusted so we'll absolutely come back to the commission and let them know how it went and I think we should plan on that as a, as a group. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and then the only other question I had, I know the Governor's Advisory Board is working on um, casino-specific recommendations and guidelines. Does anyone know whether they are also working on racing guidelines or not? I think we can anticipate for every industry their intention is to provide some level of guidance. I can't say that I've heard affirmatively that there will be, I don't know, Mr. Antonacci, I'm butchering your name this morning. And to no, help me out, Frank. Antonacci. Again? Antonacci. Antonacci. Frank works as well. Antonacci. Antonacci. Um, <clears throat> I was adding my own French into that. I'm sorry. Um, have you heard uh, that there will be industry standards? That, that really is, the, the, they have given that general guidance that they, we should anticipate for every industry, some kind of specific guidance. You heard the same, Frank? I, I, I think so. I'm not sure exactly how specific it will be for the racing industry or if they're gonna... Uh... To your point, I think, um, Commissioner O'Brien, I think everybody recognizes that there's there could be additional standards on top of any that we agree on and that the um, that the two the industry agrees on with with um, PPC. Uh, <clears throat> could I um, I think if Commissioner O'Brien does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. All right. And then Commissioner Stebbins, you had a question. Yeah, just a, a quick one that uh, for Chris that we've been addressing with our gaming licensees, and that's the the supply chain or availability of cleaning materials. Um, 
I know Lance talked about it as it relates to the casino side. Do you see any issues getting what you need for the racing side of the house, Chris? Uh, I'm not. I'm not aware of any, or have been made aware of any issues. Again, uh, obviously the the casino supplies everything for for the racing side as well. You know, but it's centralized, same same purchasing and and everything along those those lines. So. Um, we're not we're not anticipating uh, any issues, but I, I will follow up if if there is any any concerns on that. But I'm not I'm not aware of any at this point. Okay, um, and I might hold this question, but I'll put it in the back of uh, on the back uh, burner, which is and you talk about it a little bit, which is a communications plan. So at the right point, I'd like to hear more about how you and perhaps the association plan on communicating some of these guidelines to. Uh, drivers, uh, horse handlers, everybody that we need to worry about. If, if I could just then inject my question before we turn to the communications plan, could you explain in a little bit more detail how you anticipate um, helping to achieve the six foot social distancing standard? Is it, will you be using arrows? On, I'm trying to imagine how the, the navigation of the um, <clears throat> how the horses are let out and the stable, it's how close they are. If you could just go through that a little bit, please. Sure. Um, well, uh, again, uh, a, a lot of the, uh, the barn area is, is outdoors. So, um, uh, you know, we will have physical signage in certain areas, but um, put, putting stuff outside, obviously you run the risk of weather and things like that. So from, from the layout of the barn area, uh, we are, uh, depending on the number of horses that we have, um, as I mentioned, we're gonna try to group trainers together um, if they have multiple horses and leave spaces in between uh, if it's, you know, trainer, you know, Frank Athanachi, and then uh, he has three horses, maybe leave one or two stalls open and have other horses in, in the stalls next to him. Um, we will, uh, in the paddock area, uh, we will um, uh, put some, um, uh, much like the, the casino has in terms of um, uh, lines or, or ways of spacing out where people can, can be or stand in certain areas um, from, from that standpoint. So, um, uh, and, and a lot of it is, is self-policing too. You know, we, we need people to obviously uh, help us in terms of um, you know, maintaining those those distances. We will have we do have security in, in the backstretch area. Uh, we have racing officials. Uh, you know, they will certainly be looking and, and enforcing those rules as well uh, from that standpoint. And if I could just add to that, um, just it might just to, to provide a little detail. You know, a stall is where a horse is, is kind of housed. Is yeah. Thank you. By by its. Uh, I believe the, the dimensions of those stalls at Plain Ridge Park is, is 10 feet by 10 feet, might even be 12 by 10, some of them. Thank you. Uh, so so that, that, would, helps. that would help that. And uh, for anybody that's been around a horse, uh, if you're handling a horse, it would be advised that everybody stay well beyond six feet away from that horse. You don't wanna get kicked. You don't wanna get reared up on. So just safe handling protocols of a horseman lends itself to social distancing, uh, just for normal everyday safety. So I Indicators think that horses are smarter than us. They've been smarter than us for a long time, correct? Yeah, That's right. so that, that is a really good point, but it was really helpful for me to think about the, the, um, the stalls are that large and the individuals who come um, with each horse, uh, the essential personnel, they will be clustering in that area together because they come as a group. Um, and the group will never exceed right now probably more than six, correct, Alex? Of that yes. essential personnel. I think right now the guidance out of the governor's office is six. Uh, is that correct, Commissioner O'Brien? Yeah, she's nodding her head. So that actually aligns with the guidance that we, we see right now coming out of the other industries that up to six people could be associated with a particular horse in that space. Thank you, the dimensions really helped. Uh, I, I have a, a question. Um, is there, um, uh, for Chris or, or, or again, Alex, do you anticipate that 
the, the size of the field might be constrained by some way because of all the measures that you take? Number of horses that are, are uh, available okay. for any race? Uh, we're not anticipating. We, um, you know, we, we think we have adequate space in the, um, in the backstretch area. Again, the, back, the entire backstretch area now, which consists, uh, I think, of three or four barns, and I think we have about 150 or 160 stalls. Um, that whole area is going to be sort of our, it's going to be an enlarged paddock, for, let, for lack of a better term. Um, and um, so we have space. Again, we're not going to try to jam, you know, fill every one of those stalls. Uh, but with last year, I think we averaged uh, right around 10 races uh, a day, a little bit over 10, uh, average field size around seven. So you're, you're talking 70, 80, maybe 90 horses at the most on, on a given day, which we think is, you know, um, achievable uh, in terms of spacing and, and things like that. So um, we, we wouldn't see uh, any, any reason to, to necessarily restrict the um, the field sizes or any anything along those lines. It's really going to be dependent on horse availability, which I, I think people know there there's uh, um, there's a lot of competition for for horses in the region uh, as tracks start up. Uh, general horse population has been declining, um, but I, I don't see where we're going to be limiting at this point um, number of races or number of horses because of this. Thank you. Other questions so far before we continue on the, the guidelines? Chris, do you want to continue then? Um, sure. I, I think, uh, again, the, um, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned, the, um, the area that we're utilizing, uh, and again, for those who have been to Plain Ridge, is, is really our entire footprint of our backstretch area. So, Normally, we, we, we have uh, several barns where horses may have stabled there um, for the entire season. Uh, because of this change in our protocols, we, we won't be having any permanent stabling uh, this year on, on the grounds. Everything will be considered what we call ship-in barns or people ship in the day of the race uh, and ship out afterwards. Um, uh, only horses that are approved by the racing secretary and entered to race will, will be permitted on the grounds. Uh, you know, we're going to have designated parking areas for, for the individuals uh, shipping in. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be assigning stalls uh, specifically uh, um, to, to group people uh, together. Um, and we will be limiting the number of individuals coming in with each, uh, each horse. Um, the sanitizing of the areas uh, in, in the stalls and, and in the paddock. Um, Alex, uh, the administration of um, Lasix, which, which is a uh, legal medication, uh, will be handled the same way it has been uh, in terms of uh, a specific area uh, for the commission. And Alex can um, specify any, anything with the, the testing that, that may come in the, in the play. Um, the horses in terms of warming up, uh, normally when they're in the paddock area, uh, prior to the race, they go out on the track and warm up. Uh, again, logistically, that'll still be the same. It's just they'll probably have a different uh, egress and ingress area uh, through, the, through the barn area. So again, that's where we get into more of the logistics uh, for, from that standpoint, but we don't, we don't see any, any particular issues there. Um, as I mentioned, we're, we're closing down in the paddock. We have a lounge area where people will congregate and uh, there might be some food offerings there. We're, we're closing that down. The locker room area will not be uh, utilized um, uh, other than for bathroom facilities. Um, uh, everything from our racing office, uh, we're gonna limit uh, individuals uh, being able to physically come in the racing office. All our entries will be done online. All communications with horsemen will be done uh, either via phone or, or uh, via computer. Uh, we do have a text messaging system uh, set up for horsemen. You had asked about, you know, from a communication side. Um, so that's, that's very effective in getting information out uh, to uh, individuals and up-to-date information. Uh, we'll also have key people that will be uh, assigned from our side. We'll set up with the horsemen and the commission 
uh, that'll kind of be the, the key people on the ground uh, race day that uh, if any issues come up, they'll be the ones to uh, handle those situations. Um, and really, again, I, I think the, the, the main issue is just limiting access um, uh, to, to the backstretch area so we don't have a lot of people in general back there. Um, face masks, social distancing, um, you know, they're, they're, and sanitizing of, of the areas on a frequent basis. It's, it's, it's kind of a, a simple formula, but something that obviously we got to keep up with. Why don't we pause now then to just ask uh, commissioners questions. Commissioner O'Brien, do you have a question? Um, I did. In terms of the last entry on the, um, the ship in barn area, it, it puts the responsibility on the horsemen to thoroughly clean their assigned stall prior to leaving. Mm -hmm. Is there any sort of affirmative attestation process, either a sheet they check out an initial or something online where they text that they've done it just so that no one leaves and hasn't um, forgotten that? Is there like another way to just put another check in there? Uh, well, right right now we don't have a, a, a checkoff system or anything along those lines. We obviously know who was assigned the specific stalls for each day. So if there is any issues with any any individuals, we know who to follow up with uh, from that standpoint. Um, but we can certainly look at uh, whether there's um, any other uh, system to to look at from from that standpoint as well. Yeah, yeah, could I just um, a reminder you, so that people can? I mean, you know, you're supposed to do it in the gym anyway, and people will yeah. sometimes people just legitimately forget as they're packing up and leaving. So, mm -hmm. so could I just if you could point uh, it's at the bottom of which it's which the section? paragraph leading into the section that says race paddock. It's the last paragraph of the ship in barn area section. Yeah, they're the all alphabetized. Um, no, maybe I'm in the alphabetized area. Sorry. Um, so I think what you're saying is that it would be nice to have an, um, them have to affirm that they've done the cleaning. I suspect right. that for a horse stall, it seems apparent if it's been cleaned or not, um, because it, you know, you know, what the horse might leave. But I think to Commissioner O'Brien's point is that given the risks, um, it would be nice to say this has been fully cleansed in, in, in a way that may go beyond what is typically done to address a horse, but also right. to address people. Right. Is that, yeah. yeah. So yeah. there, the, the- And, and maybe, and maybe you talk about the text messaging system, right? Maybe there's some way they can respond back even to some text or something that says that they've done it, just a sort of a checklist on the way out the door. Okay. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Commissioner, sure. Commissioner Stebbins, did you want to follow up on your communications plan yeah. question? Yeah, this is a question from this uh, same section of the report, the ship in the barn area, and maybe it's just on my version, but uh, talking about when horses will be required to arrive, uh, it looks like there's a number still there to be filled in. Maybe I just have an old copy. There's yeah, that's... Horses. Yeah, that that's um, we're we're still working on that. I mean, they're uh, for the administration for the license horses have to be there uh, four hours in advance, uh, at least. Um, we're we're just working out whether there needs to be a staggering uh, of times or things like that. But uh, normally, depending um, horses will usually arrive somewhere between four and five hours before the race. Um, Frank could you know give a little bit more insight there, but uh, that. That's a number we do have to plug in there. I had a follow-up question about that, and I know we have left it um, for the MGC to talk more about uh, pre and post testing. I just wanted to know from Dr. Lifebaum's perspective <clears throat> if he is uh, anticipating any changes with regard to that. Uh, again, we'll probably try to keep it as uh, similar to what we normally do as possible. And um, I've talked to the legal team ab about um, people signing evidence cards and things like that. And it seems like the um, best uh, thing from a legal standpoint is still to get that wet signature. So um, we'll do some jurisdictions are doing like the uh, splash guard and uh, the evidence card is slipped under the 
uh, splash guard and signed and will um, <clears throat> probably uh, recommend that people bring their own pens, um, but we'll have pens available and leave them in a disinfectant solution, something along those lines. Yeah, okay. I, it just seems to me following up on communications that this training mechanism for both our staff and the participants will be a key factor here to make sure everybody's really clear on the protocols. And this is something a little bit different, right? Bring your own pen. Um, right. So just getting that training, I think, will be an, an important piece. Yes. I, I think that's really important to make sure that the employees, everyone involved in these races are afforded the same precautions that we expect to be given to the employees and patrons at the casinos. Um, and one of the concerns I have is just in terms of sanitization I know that the, the buildings are very different than a casino building, but I do note that the, the restrooms are only gonna be cleaned once once a day, and I think it might warrant um, more than once a day. I think uh, you know, something you know, in the lines of every four hours or something that we can draw from, I'm sure the guidelines that the um, governor's office is issuing on that, because I believe that these, um, uh, essential personnel who are going to want to use the restrooms and we need to make sure that they're they're uh, clean from any potential spread of the virus should one person be infected and then we should also make sure that the hand sanitizer is readily available people will be having masks but they will be interacting um, as although you know there'll be social distancing um, that will be achieved and everybody knows there it will still be relatively close quarters so I wondered if there'll be hand sanitizers attached you know on you know, every other st uh, stall or in the horse or you know at the end of and and at the beginning of the entry and the, and the exit there's just always an ability to wash your hands any thoughts on that just to up it a little bit more um, in line with what we're doing for the casinos yeah, um, we, we are planning in, in a lot of the common areas um, to, to have uh, extra sanitizing um, uh, stations and, and things like that. We are we all are also uh, encouraging the, the horsemen as well to be prepared from their side, again, with their employees and, and, and themselves to, you know, whether it's PPE or sanitizing, things like that, uh, to, you know, come prepared from that because they are there for a long period of time and, and will be um, uh, certainly um, interacting. So, um, but we're, we are covering uh, all, all the kind of central uh, common areas, so to speak, that uh, the, the availability for things like that will be in there as well. And, and I can interject here too that for Mr. McHugh, <clears throat> Uh, for your uh, association, important messaging, and I know that Commissioner Stevens is going to want to follow up on this. It's really important for you know these individuals who will be working together over the course of the racing season so closely that they take every precaution in their personal life to you know socially distance so that their bubble is limited so that. Um, we can be assured of a safe and sustainable racing season. And I'm sure you can help on your messaging through the association to remind all of the participants of, to be really um, careful of their own in, uh, personal interactions. I think, uh, you know, on, on behalf of the association, we, we've been pretty proactive throughout this. And I think today was an important step to get some clarity around the dates. Uh, because I, I would anticipate an active communication plan starting even this afternoon on what uh, what the horsemen and women can anticipate, um, what will be expected, and then uh, and, and how that's going to be achieved. So the, I think the one advantage that we have amongst others is that we do have it's a regulated body of people, so we know exactly who will be entering and exiting right. the facility at all times. And with that, we have all their contacts, we have all that information. So we have that added advantage that well before this June 29th date, we can have active communication with them 
any, as things change, if we get further guidance from the, the governor's advisory group, we'll be able to, to act quickly, in many ways quicker than other populations. Um, right. so I would anticipate us doing that. We've acted actively and proactively secured our own uh, additional PPE. I think we would, uh, we would anticipate, and we would ask our horsemen and women to come prepared with their own sanitizer and, and masks. However, we have, I think, uh, about a thousand masks, mix of cloth and, uh, and disposable on hand that we will augment any supplies that the, the track may have. This way we don't, don't run into a situation where somebody forgets a mask at home and we end up in it with an issue. So uh, hearing what, what you're all saying about active communication, we, we couldn't agree more and uh, very happy with the clarity coming from this meeting that we could start that plan. Commissioner Stebbins, do you want to add in on that at all? In terms no. of channels for communication. Okay. Yeah, no, that sounds um, that sounds great. I'm I'm, I'm glad both uh, the association and the track can uh, are doing some more on this point. I like the idea of you know as Commissioner Cameron point or Commissioner O'Brien pointed out somehow using the text messaging system. Yeah, I was just reminded. Look at some look at looking at some of the information and actual links to videos to deal with everything from how to put on PPE to how to discard PPE. You know, maybe there's an opportunity to just kind of help educate folks along by showing them what the new process might look like instead of in a written form, doing it maybe in a video form, if that's possible. I'd leave that up to everybody. Maybe to that point, and to follow up on Commissioner O'Brien's point, is have you thought about the training aspect in more detail, either Chris or Alex? Uh, I know we're we're say, saying that training should should take place, but have is there a plan already underway for that? Okay. Yeah. Um, so obviously, we'll be putting up signage um, and. Um, the uh, HHANE has already, um, from what I understand, has already posted some of the um, ways, things like how to put on your mask and take it off, things like that. Um, I can also forward them the um, different videos that our HR department has asked all of our uh, folks to look at and take. Um, and that's something that I can also forward to um, uh, Chris for language as well if they want to use those uh, different videos that talk about how to use your PPE and that type of thing. And obviously um, any employees on the racing side are uh, subject to the same um, uh, training and uh, any, any of the procedures being put in place for Plainridge Park employees in general, whether at the, the casino or the racing side, uh, they'll be subject to that same same training uh, and information dissemination as well. So the employees on the racing side will be getting uh, similar information and, and training as the uh, casino employees will as well. And Alex, maybe you might want to elaborate on on the uh, the commission's employees, and the CISO employees, and employees like yourself, because <clears throat> I know that. Derek and the uh, reopening working group has been working on the provisions for your staff there. Yes, um, Derek was nice enough to come down last week um, with a, a bunch of supplies for us. And um, I set the office up um, with the posters that Troop had printed out on um, social distancing and, and disinfecting and all so that um, our white building is um, ready for business basically and um, Bill Egan our licensing specialist started down there yesterday so um, the office is uh, as we've said in the um, plan the office itself is um, closed to um, people coming in other than those actually working in the building um, but Bill is in there now to um, start getting uh, licenses by mail and answering the phone if anybody has any licensing questions and that type of thing. And so that's excellent. And so in terms of, let's say for the testing that takes place, that's pretty close quarters in that area. Yes. Um, will you, 
be able to achieve the distancing that you need to achieve in order to administer that process, Alex, or do we need to rethink that? Well, we are going to um, have to have certain things in place. For one thing, we'll do kind of like what we did with the white building where we won't normally the um, trainer or their representative would come into the office to sign the evidence card um, along with our veterinary assistant. And usually um, several of our veterinary assistants would help seal the samples to make things go quicker. Um, but that office is very small and it also has the uh, test barn coordinator in there who does all the paperwork and all. So we'll basically make it um, off limits to everybody except for the um, coordinator and the veterinary uh, assistant who is sealing the sample. And the trainer's representative will be able to stand at the door and um, still watch the sample being sealed and everything. So we won't lose that. So you can get two people in there comfortably. Do we need to think about yes. any um, plexiglass protections, uh, commissioners? Are we, I just wanna make sure we're really thinking affirmatively here. Um, you know, in terms of where there really is a, a, a service being connected. Chris, I see you leaning in. Where it's more face-to-face -face service, where the... Yeah, um, shields. Yeah. I know we brought masks and stuff off. Are there any of those shields to be used on? Yeah, we have um, shields and masks. And um, there's been some talk, um, for instance, with the veterinarians, because that's very close contact. Mm -hmm. The um, trainer or the representative will have to hold the horse for the blood draw. Um, but uh, kind of like what Frank was saying with the horses earlier, uh, the handler will stand on the opposite side of the horse from where the veterinarian is standing. So there will be the body of a horse in between them. Okay. And unless the horse is very fractious or something, that should act as a good barrier. And we're going to uh, leave it up to the veterinarians as to um, whether they want to use the face shields um, or not, or just use the um, <clears throat> face masks. Um, we're not sure. Um, how the horses will respond to the face shields. Um, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so there are different things to um, consider. Um, so, you know, th those are a couple of the things, different things we're thinking of as far as that goes. And just so I'm clear, I was thinking, Commissioner Cameron, help me think this out. Are there any places physically where we have services interaction where, you know, for instance, the licensing and where Bill would normally work, do we need to have install any plexiglass to protect that uh, where the people are interacting because of the administrative? Report? Well, I, I, I believe uh, Dr. Lightbaum, please correct me if I didn't hear you correctly. I, I but I, yeah, I think that we're talking about leaving those applications outside, not entering the building. So then, uh, right, and I knew that, but there, there's so, not gonna be any exception, okay. Yeah, we. Oh. I th we are going to ask um, PPC to um, put a plexiglass partition up for um, part of Bill's, uh, his opening um, yes. into the entryway there. Um, there will be, for instance, a new person who has never been licensed with us. They will need to step into the office briefly, pull their mask down, get their picture taken, um, okay. things like that. So we are going to um, have plexiglass there. Um, and in the um, commission office, um, I believe the big window we have in the test barn is plexiglass. So uh, we're still working on the details, but we may end up putting a, a little cutout in there where the evidence card can be pushed out for the signature. And in case I also didn't, I might have missed it. I, th I thought there might be a few exceptions for Bill, so that's good. And then if I remember correctly where the blood is, uh, um, for the, the two, uh, staff people who are dealing with veterinarians who are dealing with the testing. Mm -hmm. There's open space, there's a shelving there, or is there glass there because of the blood samples anyway? Is there already some protection there? Right, the there's also um, that open window. And certainly um, there's different seating um, in that test area for our people if they're right in between um, getting samples that they can sit down. And we're certainly gonna have to, for instance, there's a bench. And we'll mark that bench so that, you know, it's six feet. And so we don't have people sitting closer than that. But there is some kind of a barrier now already. There's for a barrier for the office. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I, I actually, I had a follow-up question uh, from yours, uh, Chair. Uh, the only other place that I can think of is the, the, the official's booth, which is oh, uh, yes. a small, small quarters. 
any anything i mean it's it's usually the same people but um is there anything that you're contemplating alex uh for that space yes we've had discussions and and that space is um probably too small for three people with the social distancing so um what the idea that we're considering is there's a small office right next door where the announcer is and um they can possibly move the announcer to a different location. And so one of the judges can stand in that room right next to the judges stand. And um, they'll have the same view of the track as they would in the judges stand. And then if anything happens in the race and they need to look at the videos, um, they can, um, one of the judges, yeah, they can cycle in and out. So I think we're, we've had got that handled as well. Is that open to open air also, or are those all closed windows? It's closed. I think at Commissioner O'Brien, we, we weren't sure of that. So they are closed windows. Okay. Um, okay. Alex, quick question for you. Um, obviously, you have a very talented team with specific skills. Um, what kind of becomes your backup strategy if uh, a few individuals, you know, uh, aren't feeling well and have to call out? So that, that's something that we've uh, had discussions with um, in our um, groups with the horsemen and, and with Plain Ridge. All of us are dealing with um, small staffs. The horsemen, you know, are, have short staff. So if um, one of the people in their bubble group um, gets ill, it's going to affect them all. And um, same with PPC. They have a, you know, a small staff and we do too. Um, everybody's got um, their... Uh, I can't think of the word right now, but um, people, oh, cross-trained. We've got lots of cross-training so that we do have people that can sub in and out. And obviously um, we do that on a regular basis if somebody's um, out sick for a day or two. Um, if um, people have to go out for 14 days and it affects multiple people in our staff, that will be difficult. And, um, you know, we've all discussed that, that it's really important that um, the horsemen, the PPC folks and our folks all really adhere to this, uh, all these protocols um, and to do the best we can not to have um, anybody down there come down with it. Okay. And on our end, we're talking about certain things like, for instance, with the veterinarians, usually we swap out the veterinary assistants and they do different jobs during the week. And so they may be with one veterinarian uh, one day and with another one the next day. Um, at least for now, we'll probably assign um, them to a specific uh, job title, you know, so one will always go with a blood gas veterinarian um, and then maybe, you know, the others will stay with uh, the Lasix veterinarian and then the others in the test barn. And that okay. way, <clears throat> hopefully we'll, if somebody does um, get sick, we'll eliminate how many people are um, in that group that have possibly been exposed. Do you have a, do you have a, I, kn I know we've um, had a backup plan when, uh, when we've missed a judge, is, is that same kind of protocol in place? Yes, we do have a couple of fill-in judges that we can um, have join us, so, okay. you know, we do, like I said, we do have some backups, and we have people that are cross-trained. Okay, that's good to hear. Thank you, Alex. Just a pause um, for, technically, I understand that there's, some background noise so to the extent that you have background noise if you could mute until you speak that would be great i think it's just interfering a little bit with the video so thank you uh, following up on on any other questions i know i have one just slipped my mind oh i know following up on uh, commissioner stebbins on illness i may have missed missed this provision so forgive me if i did but I, I think it's quite standardized out of the governor's guidance that um, in the of what you the steps you need to take in the event someone does test positive for COVID-19, I think it's an alert, Chris. Uh, you would it would reflect exactly what's in the casino guidelines. Uh, there needs to be outreach to the local public health commission, and it's and then that I think we also would expect to be notified, not necessarily of the details um, of who, but that there has been an outbreak. And, and most importantly, that we know all the steps have been taken. Um, and so for the casinos, there was a designation, uh, we expected a designation of a pandemic security officer. 
I believe we want to take that kind of a protocol here with respect to racetrack so that one person is, is accountable for ensuring the proper notice to the local health um, department. But those provisions we can make available, it's standardized across um, the industries for the guidance out of the governor's office. That way they can do their contact tracing. And as, as Frank already noted, it, you know, this is a, a quite a close community. So you, you really do know who will be there. So that will be really helpful. But we wanna make sure we have those protocols in place. Other comments and uh, questions for uh, Chris and Alex, Mr. McHugh, at this time? <clears throat> I don't think that this is, this isn't even, um, we haven't even marked this up for a formal adoption. This really is for just to lay out discussion, correct, Alex? That was the goal for today with respect to these matters. Yes. I think then uh, I, I don't want to disrupt the um, the conversation because I want to make sure we've covered all the points. Commissioner Cameron, are you, is there anything that you think that we need to address with respect to the safety guidelines? I know you asked for them first, and and uh, we knew they would be coming. They were accelerated a bit because of the shift from phase four to phase three. Um, at this juncture. We have a solid draft. Do we um, uh, individually chew on this some more? And then Alex, maybe incorporate some of the feedback you've received so far, and then mark this up for a more formal adoption. Uh, down the road, we may also receive some additional guidance from the governor's office if, you, if, if they are able to share or if they have thoughts. We don't know yet what will happen in terms of timing with them. Always. You know, they will be subject to whatever further restriction they um, or overlay the uh, the administration adds because the public health will trump any of our our industry interests. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I um, certainly appreciate the fact that all of the groups have worked together, and they, there is a consensus about best practices here. And um, any questions I've I've asked. Uh, even prior to this, they've been thoughtful about looking at that matter. Um, I would uh, ask that, uh, that Chris, if there are some lessons learned in the next week or so from your other jurisdictions, you mentioned one, you had a change of plan already. I think you were talking about something site specific in that location, uh, the Pennsylvania harness track that you opened. But, um, you know, I would, I would, certainly anticipate that you would be in touch with Dr. Lightbaum and and if there is something that we need to change because of what you've learned elsewhere that would be um, helpful in making sure we do it uh, do this is um, uh, you know with with safety in mind and every consideration before we open in in a couple of weeks. Uh, certainly, uh, Commissioner, and uh, as we said, I, I think the, the document we, we go in with um, probably will have some adjustments as, as we learn. Um, the qualifying races, as we've mentioned before, uh, are a good test run to, to make sure that you know, what we think is the right thing to do uh, is actually in practice uh, uh, follows through that way. So um, yeah, we, we, we certainly will um, adjust this as, as we see necessary, get the feedback from everyone and uh, keep uh, communicating the updates. Commissioner Zuniga, did you have comment, question? Uh, no, no, just on the qualifying races, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, I just, I couldn't tell if you were leading in. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. Other commissioner comments? So, yeah, <clears throat> I think, Correct me, commissioners, if I'm wrong, but the next steps would be, we do want to um, review the final, correct? And either adopt them as our, endorse, endorse them. Um, if they're all in agreement and we are in agreement, we couldn't give our endorsement. Is that what we're imagining? Is that they become um, endorsed or, or adopted by us as well, that we do need to take a formal action? Commissioner Cameron, I see you shaking your head. 
Okay. Excellent. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So well, yes, I think it does, especially if it requires a waiver, as we were talking about. Well, and that's the that's just the the pieces. If, if it were just the pieces that PPC, Penn National, and the Harness Horsemen were taking, um, then I still think we'd want to endorse. We have some work to do on our own pieces. It looks like, and so. I want to be really cognizant of time. We want to make sure that we are all aligned to make sure that our work is all in place uh, to ensure that there's there's no delay. So we will carefully look at our schedule. But I'm thinking, um, Alex, we have um, we have this Thursday uh, uh, probably too soon because we wouldn't be able to mark it up. But we do have next week, we have an agenda setting meeting on Wednesday, and we have a special meeting really de dedicated to community mitigation. But there might be an opportunity to act on this. I don't know if, if um, Karen, you're available. I know that she's right now uh, not on video. Uh, if that, because that would be the 25th, correct? The, yes. the next meeting, yes, that's correct. If that might make sense to at least anticipate final action on these again subject to whatever comes out of the state mm -hmm. and, the, and of course always the federal government and local government yeah. commissioner okay. Brian, you're shaking your head that seems yeah. like a, i know I, I to go any further um won't be helpful the good news is i don't see anything in these guidelines that requires significant runway in other words you've made a lot of the ppe purchases so you know that wasn't new to you is there um, but but the one thing we will talk about is the the uh, preparation of the racetrack alone but in terms of these safety guidelines i don't see anything that requires us to act on so that you know it's an affirmative requirement for and it takes a few weeks everything is pretty much set to go correct right <laughs> sorry no, I mean, I'm looking at everybody, so it's um, a little bit of the Brady Bunch uh, challenge. Uh, Karen, so why don't we think about that timing? Okay. Mr. Cameron, you agree? Yeah, I think that is, if the governor's opening, reopening allows for the, the 29th to be the first day of qualifying, I think that would be important to get it done before that. Yeah. If need be, we could even go earlier. You know, we could always call a meeting. Yes. But we want to mark it up properly. So let's just make sure we get to the work that we need to be. If we need to have a, a special meeting to just tend to the variances, we could call that pod. So let's look at, at that um, and assess that need. All right. Thank you. Now, um, moving on to some of the other matters that are just associated with opening. Uh, and before we get to the items on the agenda that uh, require particular attention, I wondered if you could just update us, Chris, on the, um, the racetrack al um, alone and what's necessary for it to be prepared uh, for safe racing. Sure. Um, well, we, we do have, uh, we're calling back our uh, crews now. It's, um, we, we did have furloughs uh, for a long period of time, just so we did it on the uh, casino side because of the um, closure of, of the um, casino. Uh, we're in the process of calling uh, individuals back now that are beginning to work uh, uh, both in the in the barn area um, for cleanup and any any repairs necessary back there, and the uh, the, the track uh, surface, uh, which we did have some. Um, some work done over the shutdown, uh, so we're not completely starting at um, uh, at ground zero. Uh, I think we're we're far enough along where right now we can, um, in a, in a fairly quick time frame, um, get the track prepared uh, in a uh, you know in a safe manner and have it ready, race ready uh, to hit our target dates as as we said. Um, so. We're confident we uh, we will get that uh, done and uh, have all those items in place by the dates that we had indicated. And in terms of oversight or any inspection that needs to happen, is that also lined up by an outside party? Does that have 
Is that, is that part of the um, equation? Uh, yes, we're we're in the process of of uh, securing the individual uh, for that, uh, and I believe uh, Steve O'Toole uh, will be coordinating in terms of the date with uh, Alex Lightbaum um, for for that inspection. U usually, it happens right around when the the qualifiers are are starting. Uh, from that standpoint, based on prior years' uh, experience. Okay. Other questions for Chris? And, and Alex, if you want to chime in on that. Uh, yes, um, it, Steve's got somebody that in mind that he's lining up. Um, obviously, um, we almost got to that point um, right before the COVID hit. So that's, this has been in the plans for a while. Um, and um, USTA, the US uh, Trotting Association, uh, did come out with uh, rules um, guiding um, racetrack maintenance and that type of thing. Uh, Steve is a director on the USTA for District 9, so um, he was actually um, involved in this rulemaking process, and um, he kept me updated as it was going through their process and then when it was uh, adopted, and um, so they'll be following um, that protocol. Any questions on just the racetrack, its integrity? Again, as much as we, as I said, the health and well-being of all in current circumstances that's required, but we've always been concerned about the safety of the horses, so we don't want to forget that that's um, part of our, our core oversight. Okay, now before we move to the um, off from item number, uh, number 2A and move on to B, C, and D, are there any other questions that you can, uh, that you'd like to present to folks, or is there any other uh, matters that uh, Frank or um, Mr. McHugh or Mr. Corey would like to raise before we move on to more official business? Chris, if you'd like to add in, or Dr. Lightbound. Um, I have uh, just w one other item, uh, Madam Chair, and um, not specifically with the live racing. And I, I think this is a discussion that um, on Thursday, there, there's a discussion about simulcasting. Uh, and um, I, I just wanna put out there, you know, the current terminology in the phase three for live racing indicates no spectator, it indicates horse racing, simulcasting, no spectators, which is, is kind of contradictory. Um, I, I think you're well aware, um, simulcasting, um, people are physically there watching races on, on television screen, things like that. Um, and, and we're really trying, our situation with simulcasting is no different than a Suffolk Downs or a Raynham. Uh, basically it's the same type of setup, same, same logistics, same, same business. Uh, the only thing that's different is we're at a racetrack casino facility, uh, they're kind of in a standalone facility, but it, really it's the same process. Um, we, we're just looking for, for clarity or, or hoping that whatever is given for those locations, Random and Suffolk, you know, would apply to us as well and the ability to conduct simulcasting in the same way that they're, they're permitted to. Um, and even the conduct of live racing without spectators at this point, uh, there's a good possibility the casino may be opening, um, hopefully on the 29th as well, or in that same proximity. Um, if customers are coming to the casino, uh, there'll be a lot of those customers. They have protocols for entrance, people who would be coming to the simulcasting or even live racing would be subject to the same protocols. It, you know, we, we feel that really there's no, no real distinction um, in terms of limiting people from coming for the racing or the simulcasting uh, at that point. So we're, we're trying to get some clarity. We're trying to get some confirmation that, you know, we can at least be on a level playing field uh, from that standpoint. Uh, and again, I think we're in a better spot because we'll be adopting the casino protocols for anybody coming in for those things. So if anything, our standards might be higher than what's being done at other places. So wanted to put that out there because that is a revenue source, not only for us, but the horsemen as well for purse money, for the 
for the racing commission for taxes and things like that. So we're, we're hopeful that we can, we can get that clarification or at least be able to uh, be on, be, be able to conduct the same type of business that, that the others in the industry are able to at the same time. Yeah, I think that that's a really fair concern. And I know the advisory board um, you know, has had a big job learning a lot about a lot of different industries over the course of a very short period under the most trying of circumstances. And so horse racing is probably, a, and simulcasting is a bit of a, a new industry to many. So I think that the request for clarification will be heard. Um, I think those questions are being raised. So the um, what I, I haven't heard yet, Chris, is that um, if uh, the, again that wouldn't that wouldn't alter any um, any preparation um, if they were given a, a guidance today or a little bit later, provided that it's explained by the beginning of phase phase three. Uh, because it would, or is there, are there some opening preparations that would extend if, if there were further clarification on that to you? Uh, no, I mean, the, the, the conduct of the qualifying race, if, if you're saying the conduct of the qualifying races and the live racing being impacted by that, um, no, we're, we're, we're going forward, uh, you know, on that. As long as there's no changes, as we said, in the uh, Protocols and procedures yeah. for, for specifically for that, um, but we 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 do we would be hopeful that if um, uh, if other locations are able to conduct simulcasting, uh, right. that we be able to have that same ability. And if the casino building is open, right. you know, again, having people for live racing is really no different than having people come to the casino or come for simulcasting. It's um, as you said, I think there's maybe some education there that's necessary, but right. it really shouldn't be a distinction. And, and other racetracks are now opening up with allowing customers on site now, I think, uh, again, under certain provisions and protocols and capacity limits and things like that. I think it's fair to say that clarification is, needs to be provided. My instinct to, to assign some practical interpretation of that language would be that the spec, no spectator was the terminology assigned to the horse racing, that there wouldn't be spectators in stands, if you will. We know that there aren't stands at PPC, but if, if um, we applied some practical thinking, it would be horse racing without spectators, but simulcasting is permitted with phase three. And simulcasting, what you're really saying is it's not so much spectators, they're actually the betters. They're live people who are going in and they're simulcasting, you're placing your bet at the facility. So at Suffolk Downs, they're placing the bet there. They may be watching horse racing at any other place in the country, but they are not actually spectators of live racing. They're, they're just, they're patrons or betters at the facility. And the same with PPC, it would be patrons who are, um, at your simulcasting um, facility, placing their bet, potentially with respect to the live racing that will be going on. But on a day when there's no live racing, they would be placing a bet on racing anywhere really around the world, correct? Yep, no, you've, so, you, you so outlined, think, you've outlined it correctly there, yes. Yeah, so I think the word spectator um, should be uh, and I can't speak for the governor's office, but I'm just saying a pragmatic interpretation of the language would be spectators is associated with people who are cheering on the horse racing. It's associated with spectators in a sports venue where the patrons who are associated with placing a bet for simulcasting would probably be not referred to as ever spectators. It would be betters or, or patrons. And I think a practical interpretation would be simulcasting opens with phase three, like casinos or horse racing. So if that's helpful, but again, I'm being very careful. I'm giving a pragmatic interpretation of that language based on how I view it. It deserves further clarification and, we, you know, and, and questions have been raised. So we're, we should anticipate some clarification on that. Um, I don't know, Frank, if you want to add in, but that's just my logic. 
and I, I think from the horseman's perspective, we, we support exactly what Chris is kind of uh, bringing up. And, and I think uh, your interpretation that that uh, it's consistent with whatever capacity standards or limits are put on the casino. Yeah. Or other small casting yeah. facilities. Okay, so that's a, an open issue. We'll stay tuned on that. And I think, uh, you know, all parties have a fair fair interest in understanding exactly where um, uh, the advisory board and the administration will go with respect to that nuance. Thank you. Anything uh, I, I spoke, that was simply my interpretation. I don't know if um, Commissioner Zuniga, Commissioner Cameron, if, if you want to chime in, that's just my, my, I'm not speaking for the commission at all. Commissioner O'Brien, Mr. Stebbins. Yes, um, Marty, Mr. Corey. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to uh, thank you and Commissioner Cameron and Dr. Lightbaum uh, for the work that you've done bringing this roundtable together this morning. I'm very encouraged by the conversation and the uh, obvious work that you've put together in advancing the uh, relationship and, and the conversation to put together uh, the plan to get phase three opening of live racing at Plain Ridge Park. And I'm very encouraged by what I hear and wanted to thank you for your efforts. And Dr. Lightbaum, uh, thank you so much for uh, your hard work on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Corey. I, and before we close, I think we did have Commissioner Zuniga, I was going to make a comment too. And then just close on this issue. Yeah. Thank you. No, I, just to agree with your, with your point, Chair, that I guess I, I imagined the simulcasting to be uh, treated uh, just like the casino, an enclosed space where you need to have some physical distancing and mask wearing uh, and, and so on. And that could be accomplished through a number of things, uh, you know, either removing tables or, uh, you know, signage and everything. Um, I was not particularly not not necessarily um, you know uh, honing in on the on the spectating part as you say I think it's more about the occupancy and uh, as others have said right and and correct me uh, Chris but does the space is an extension of the casino so all the safeguards that are applying to the casino I think we actually asked this question um, would extend out to that beautiful open space that extends to the the racetrack correct. Yeah. Uh, that is correct. Um, the uh, the plan, as I understand, uh, for entrance into the casino, uh, it will be a single entrance, I, I think, through the uh, valet entrance. Uh, the racing customers would have to come and simulcast customers would have to come through that same entrance, same entrance requirements, uh, I, I believe. Um, if, if there is a temperature check or, or other screening, uh, racing simulcast customers will go through the same process as the uh, casino customers. Uh, we've already uh, set up in the racing areas um, uh, plexiglass at the teller windows, uh, removal of uh, about half the chairs and tables uh, in, in the simulcast area uh, for the social distancing. Uh, same cleaning methods uh, will be done as done on the casino side. Um, so yes, we're, we're treating those areas exactly the same as we would the casino uh, game plan. So uh, again, I think they would be at a probably a higher standard than maybe some of the other locations are, are um, uh, planning at this point just because we have the casino attached to it. Further questions, comments? Commissioner Stebbins, Commissioner O'Brien, all set? All set. Okay, and Commissioner Cameron, all set for right now. So um, there's been some focus on the qualifying races. I think it might make sense for us to just bring that up in the agenda. So we'll, um, we'll first focus on uh, 2C, if that makes sense, so that we understand first off what qualifying races are and what the request is where we are on, on this matter. I'll start with um, Dr. Lightbound. Uh, you don't mind me going out of order, correct? Okay. No. Okay. Not at all. Thank you. So uh, just to kind of key these up, the three items that are on here, um, B, C, and D, were all on the commission agenda 
for our March 12th meeting. And that meeting was the one that was canceled halfway through due to the COVID. So um, these items uh, didn't get acted on at that time. And now it's um, the appropriate time to bring them forward again. So um, item C, um, the request from Plain Ridge Park for a waiver of uh, 205 CMR uh, 312 uh, 7 is the qualifying race requirement. Uh, the commission has had this in front of them um, for the last several years. Right in the rule, it does say that the association, which is Plain Ridge, can ask for a waiver of this. And um, the commission has granted um, this uh, request from 30 days to 45 days. And so, um, in uh, harness racing, if a horse hasn't raced for a certain number of days, they need to go into a qualifying race. Um, a qualifying race has no purse and it has no betting. And um, what it does is it will give the horse an official line that'll go into the program. Um, it allows the um, association veterinarian to make sure the horses are fit and sound. And um, as uh, Chris mentioned earlier, it also helps um, give the um, better an idea on um, what the form of the horse is at that point. So um, I'm very comfortable with moving it from the 30 days to the 45 days. Question, Dr. Commissioner Cameron. Yeah, Dr. Lightham, I know there was some request um, to did not use the qualifying um, process at all. Now, I know we've talked about that and you were explaining to me uh, from a safety standpoint how that would not be appropriate. Could you um, just elaborate on that, please? Yes, um, as I stated, it, it gives a chance to make sure that the horses to, in order to qualify out of that race, to go on to a um, pair mutual race, there's a certain time that they have to rate, uh, go in in the race. Um, so it again, it is a safety issue. Make sure the horse is fit and to uh, make sure they're sound. Um, give the horse a you know a way of going around the track ahead of time before they're in an actual race. So um, and I believe that at this point um, the Harness Horsemen's Association is um, on board with this um, request to move it from the 30 days to 45 days. And the two days um, that was outlined earlier, whatever the timing of those two days, that's enough time to appropriately get those uh, horses qualified? Yes, uh, most of these horses race once a week. So the horses that qual uh, if it falls under the governor's guidelines for opening um, <clears throat> on the 29th, uh, those horses that qualified on that Monday would be ready to race back the following Monday on the 6th in an actual paramutual race. And then um, if, with the Thursday um, qualifiers on the second, those horses would be ready to race back on the Thursday and Friday of the following week as well. Um, if there is um, an abundance of horses, um, there's a possibility that a third day could be added in. We'll just wait and see what the horse population looks like. Okay, but everybody's in agreement. Thank you, that's important. Commissioner Seneca, you also had a question on qualifying races. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, much of which, which was already answered, but uh, let me um, just ask so that I make sure I, I understand it. Um, the waiver from 30 to 45 days, which we've done in the past, has the net effect of being not a matter, it doesn't matter in this case, right? Because it, it's fair to say that nobody has really raced, you know, in many more days than 45 days. Uh, that that would be correct, uh, Commissioner. This this is really for the entirety of the the current race meet. Uh, once once we get started in racing, uh, so uh, again going forward, that'll be the rule for the entire uh, entire season uh, in terms of extending that that qualifying period. So you, you are correct. It 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 doesn't necessarily uh, address the the issue of the long layoffs at the beginning, which is the reason we're doing the qualifying races now. So they, they will be qualified, but this will be uh, in effect for the entire meet uh, as okay. well, and which, which has been done uh, for the past several years. So uh, it's something we're, we're comfortable with uh, and the horsemen support as well. Okay. Well, I look forward to getting an update as, uh, as we, I, I know we will relative to how many horses and horsemen 
show up for those qualifying races, uh, which will give us a better indication of um, how much more, how many more races are needed, qualifying races. I'd like to add that, you know, <clears throat> with respect to whether or not we could have considered waiving qualifying races altogether, I'm terribly sympathetic for the horse racing community in terms of the dire straits that they've faced over the last several months. Uh, <clears throat> it's been a very difficult time for them, not only uh, exacerbated by all the isolation that we've all experienced, but also, of course, the economic impact on that community in particular. So it would have been very exciting to be able to begin racing with the purse available. I think that Alex has outlined why it's so critical to have these qualifying races, particularly in these times, to make sure that to the best of our ability, the horses are safe and sound and, and ready, ready to race. And um, we, I'm pleased that there's an agreement today on that. So, you know, we are all just hopeful that uh, racing can open where the horses, the riders are safe, and then the community is also protected against the impact of the virus. So thank you on that. Um, <clears throat> so do we need a, um, are there any further comments on the issue of qualifying racing? Because it, 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 it was, it's a little bit confusing um, in terms of where we were mainly because as Alex said, we were ready to go March 12th. All set? Do we have, want to um, have a, a motion then on on this um, particular matter? Madam Chair, I'd move that the commission approve the request of Plain Ridge Park Casino for a waiver of the 2020 yeah. or the 2020 yeah. racing season with respect to 205 CMR 3.127, which would require all horses not showing a satisfactory racing line during the previous 45 days to run a qualifying mile in a race before the judges. Second. Any further questions, comments? Just point of clarification, is it sub six or sub seven? Um, seven. It, seven. It's seven, that, that okay. was my mistake. At one point okay. the um, regulations uh, got renumbered and okay. I didn't do the uh, cut and paste on that regulation okay. number. Thanks. Good clarification, thank you. Any other comments? Excellent, um, I'll take a roll call vote. Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. And I vote yes. Five zero, Shara, thank you very much. Okay, now we'll go back to um, item 2A, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, 2B on the uh, agenda. Um, Alex, if you wanna elaborate, please. So this is their uh, annual request for approval of their racing officials and key operating personnel. Uh, these folks have all been um, in their positions before with uh, Plain Ridge Park Casino. And so they're well known to us. And um, as we do in the past, um, we'll ask that they be approved pending um, licensing and um, the background check by the state police. Um, not all of these folks are in yet as far as their applications go. And I don't know if Chris has anything he'd like to add. Uh, nothing else, Alex. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any questions for Alex on this? I'm looking the uh, list of the individuals, of course, referenced in the packet. Um, I don't think I have a page number, but for operating personnel, there's seven individuals listed in about 15 for racing officials, and that will that will carry you through the season, Alex? Yes. Any questions for Alex? Uh, Commissioner Cameron, you know many of these individuals personally, you're all set? I do, yes, and I'm happy to see there's some redundancy there. As we talked about earlier, everybody has a short staff, so um, that, that's nice to see that they've really thought about some, some backup plans here and some cross-training. So um, are we ready for a motion? We are. Okay, I move that the commission approve the Plain Ridge Park Casino's list of key operating personnel and racing officials dated March 5th, 2020, as included in the commissioner's packet, pending satisfactory completion of licensure by the Massachusetts Gaming Commission Racing Division 
and satisfactory completion of their backgrounds checked by the Massachusetts State Police. Second. Second from Commissioner O'Brien. Thank you. Any further questions or comments on this? All right, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stebbins. Aye. I vote yes, 5-0. Thank you very much. Moving on now to item 2D, closing out our, our agenda for the day. Um, Dr. Lightbaum. So again, this is a um, annual request. Um, the Standard Bed Owners of Massachusetts is the uh, group that uh, has the, uh, there's a, basically the representative group of the Standard Bed Readers. And in the, uh, in our regulations, it does need to be um, approved. They're not specifically named in the um, regulations, unlike the uh, thoroughbred people. Um, I believe Nancy Longabody, the secretary and treasurer for the group, is on the line. If uh, she would like to unmute and, and speak. I am here. Can you hear me? Hi, yes. Nancy. Yes, we can hear you. Hi. Hi. Great. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Nancy Longabardi, and I am indeed the secretary treasurer for the Standard Bread Owners of Massachusetts. Um, I would like to thank the commissioners for hearing our annual request for the program. And as Dr. Lightbaum stated, um, I believe I was next to speak three months, three months before. Um, so here we are um, again. And one thing's for sure, which is exciting and great for the program, is the mayors did have their foals all across the Commonwealth. So that's exciting for um, breeding and racing. Um, and we're looking forward to getting back onto the track and are still hopeful, you know, to have a good season um, once again. Um, fortunately for us, our races are scheduled into the fall, which which will be very helpful. So um, that's a good thing. Um, I just wanted to share with you some of the highlights from the past season. Uh, we had a total of 35 races with uh, 217 starters. Our purses awarded were um, just a bit over 1.7 million. Our average field size had increased um, very nicely in 2019. Um, our general numbers for 2019, um, we had 141 mares, 99 yearlings, 92 two-year-olds. Uh, we had 32 three-year-olds um, with a total of 364 horses registered, individual horses registered in the program. Um, in 2020, we have 121 mares, um, and they're spread out over 35 farms across the Commonwealth. So we're, we're still moving forward, so we, we like that. Um, our group would like to um, thank the Plain Ridge staff and Dr. Lightbaum staff for their continued help and support every year during our races. It can be a little bit confusing. It's a lot of horses, but everything goes very smoothly, um, as I said, with all of their help. So we do appreciate that. Um, a couple of things that we were we were hoping to um, do outside of racing this year. Um, we were planning to support um, the Polar Plunge, a local charitable organ event um, put together by the local communities of Norfolk, Rentham, and Plainville. And they are hoping to still hold that in November. Um, could be a little chilly, but um, we look forward to getting involved with that. Um, also, we um, are looking into a retraining program for the mass bred horses, um, kind of as they move into their next phase of their life after after their track um, days are complete. So we we are going to um, definitely, you know, get involved in that. Um, Obviously, with the with the COVID, it's made it a little bit more difficult to to do some projects. Um, we also would have loved to have done another video, which I know the commission um, has always enjoyed previously. But there again, um, hopefully, we will do it next year when um, things get back to a little bit back to normal. So, um, I just want to thank you again for hearing our request, and I'd be happy to answer any questions at this time. Any questions? Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And 
thank you for sharing. You're welcome. The, this, thank you for sharing the statistics. Very interesting, Sharon. Perhaps maybe we can highlight, pull those out, and, and circulate that so that the commissioners can can uh, see those numbers. That's excellent. Um, thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Nancy? I don't have a question, Madam Chair, but uh, just uh, I do love your videos, Nancy. You know that. And, um, <laughs> I know um, you do. <laughs> but, but I love the verbal update as well. We're, we're all adjusting, right? So it's great to see the right. uh, program working so effectively. That's a good sign for the future. And it's always mm -hmm. nice to hear about your charitable activities as well. So I thank you for that update. It's, it's really helpful to us to understand how well things are working in, in um, standard bread racing. So thanks. You're welcome. Commissioners, I think Alex needs um, action. Uh, do we have a motion? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I move the commission approve the request of the Standard Bread Owners of Massachusetts, Inc to be recognized as the group of representative standard bread breeders to administer the standard bread breeding program and the sire stakes race for 2020. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion or comments? Okay. Um, I just uh, had a, a technical issue. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner uh, Zuniga. Aye. Commissioner Stevens. Aye. I vote yes, 5-0. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> before we, we close, I, the, the, um, the agenda does allow for any commission updates at this, at this juncture. Is there anything that any of my fellow commissioners wish to bring forward today? We're lucky that we're going to be meeting tomorrow and on Thursday. I, so. <laughs> Commissioner uh, Cameron, do you have any update? I do not, thank you. Are we all set then? Thank you, before uh, we, we uh, move for any uh, adjournment, I just wanna thank our, our guests and participants today, Mr. Antonacci, Mr. Corey, Mr. McHugh, Bob, thank you so much for coming today. <clears throat> we didn't hear much from you, but I know that you were listening intently and then um, Chris, thank you for your guidance. This was uh, very helpful for me and I suspect for my fellow commissioners. So we uh, appreciate your, your showing up and, and participating very, very much. Thank you very much for having this and uh, we look forward to uh, getting back to racing uh, in the near future. And same for the horsemen and women. It's uh... It, it is a little bit of a niche industry and can be a little confusing at times. So we're happy to be here to, to maybe put some things in, in layman terms uh, to help you understand it. So we, we appreciate this opportunity. We really do. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. If we're all set then, um, I need a motion. Move to adjourn. Second. Thank you, Commissioner. Any questions, any comments, any edits? Commissioner Cameron. Aye. Commissioner O'Brien. Aye. Commissioner Zinnica. Aye, thank you everybody. Commissioner Steffens. Aye, thanks everybody. And I vote yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Everyone be safe. <laughs>